NASA's Lunar CubeSat, Capstone, which had lost contact with Earth 11 hours after its deployment, has bounced back from the mishap. The CIS Lunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, or the Capstone, was launched towards the Moon aboard a Rocket Lab Electron rocket on June 28. The primary goal of the mission is to test and validate the calculated orbital stability of a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon, which is the same orbit planned for NASA's Gateway mission. In a July 5 statement, NASA stated that the 25 kg CubeSat experienced communications issues during its second pass with the Deep Space Network, following its July 4 deployment from the Electron rocket's Lunar Photon Kick stage. According to NASA, the spacecraft made contact with NASA two times shortly after separation, but went dark for unknown reasons. The loss of contact forced the capstone team to delay the CubeSat's first trajectory correction engine burn, which had been scheduled for July 5. But this was not a major issue, because the spacecraft has enough fuel to handle such delays. NASA announced a day after the anomaly that the mission team had re-established contact with the probe and had determined what caused the dropout. According to NASA, during the commissioning of the spacecraft, the Deep Space Network team noted inconsistent ranging data. While investigating this, the spacecraft operations team sent an improperly formatted command that made the spacecraft's radio inoperable. The spacecraft's autonomous flight software system eventually cleared the fault and brought the spacecraft back into communication with the ground. Shortly after the communication issue was resolved, Capstone performed its first trajectory correction maneuver. The spacecraft was approximately 465,000 kilometers from Earth at the time of the execution, which is 81,000 kilometers beyond the orbit of the Moon. There will be a series of other burns in the coming weeks and months, allowing Capstone to fine-tune its trajectory before the gravity of the Earth-Moon system pulls it back towards the Moon. While trajectories of this type take much longer to reach the Moon, they will significantly reduce the fuel required. If everything goes as planned, the CubeSat will enter a highly elliptical near-rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon on November 13. Please watch my previous video to learn about the Capstone mission in detail, link in the description. A Falcon 9 rocket carrying 53 Starlink Internet satellites into orbit lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on July 7. It was SpaceX's 50th Starlink mission, including the Transporter 1 rideshare mission in 2021. About eight and a half minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9's first stage came back to Earth for a touchdown on the SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the 13th mission for this particular booster, tying a company record set just a month ago on another Starlink launch. SpaceX's broadcast ended before the satellites were deployed into low Earth orbit by the rocket's upper stage, but SpaceX confirmed on Twitter that that milestone went smoothly. SpaceX has launched 2,759 Starlink satellites so far. 2,506 of them are currently in orbit, and 2,039 are presently operational. Just hours after the Starlink mission on Thursday, SpaceX announced a new Starlink product, dubbed Starlink Maritime. The satellite delivered broadband service promises high-speed low-latency internet with up to 350 megabits per second download speed while at sea. The service is primarily for all types of seagoing vessels, including merchant vessels, oil rigs, and premium yachts. Starlink Maritime's hardware consists of two terminals and costs $10,000, plus a monthly fee of $5,000. According to SpaceX, Starlink Maritime is easy to install and can withstand extreme weather at sea. The announcement also demonstrated the significant difference in video quality that SpaceX achieved through Starlink from its drone ships that are used to recover the Falcon 9 boosters at sea. The regular satellite internet cannot withstand the extreme vibrations of a rocket landing, causing live feed distortions. On the other hand, Starlink is unaffected by such barriers and maintains its speed. Moreover, prior to Starlink, SpaceX had to pay $165,000 per month for internet coverage. Starlink has reduced this to $50,000 per month, a reduction of roughly 70%. The Starlink maritime coverage map indicates the service currently hugs the US, Australian, and European coastlines. However, SpaceX is planning to start expanding the coverage. The commissioning of the James Webb Space Telescope is almost complete, and the Webb team will soon reveal unprecedented and detailed views of the universe. The telescope is set to reveal the first truly science-grade images and spectroscopic data on July 12 at 2.30 p.m. UTC. NASA has already released the target list for Webb's first images. Each image will be made available on social media as well as the agency's website at the same time. Recently, NASA released a tantalizing teaser photo captured by Webb during a thermal stability test in mid-May. The test image features bright stars with their six long sharply defined diffraction spikes. 
Beyond the stars, galaxies cover almost the entire background. According to web scientists, this engineering image, which is the result of 72 exposures taken over 32 hours, is among the deepest images of the universe ever taken. But the image is not perfect. The centers of bright stars appear black because they saturate Webb's detectors. The image's edges and corners also show the overlapping frames of the different exposures. The release of the first images on Tuesday will mark the official beginning of Webb's science operations, which will continue to explore the mission's key science themes. NASA's Mars rover, Perseverance, continues to probe the planet's surface for signs of water and ancient life. The rover, which is currently exploring an ancient river delta inside Jezero Crater, collected its ninth Martian rock sample on July 7. Perseverance has been exploring the 45 kilometers wide Jezero Crater for over a year now. Scientists believe the crater was once home to a lake and a river delta, making it an ideal location to look for signs of ancient life and water. NASA and the European Space Agency are planning to send robotic missions to the Red Planet by the end of this decade to return the samples collected by Perseverance. While Perseverance is exploring Mars, its companion, the Ingenuity rover, has completed its 29th flight on the Red Planet. According to the Ingenuity team, conditions at the Jezero crater have become extremely challenging for the helicopter, and the dipping temperature has taken its toll on its instruments. Ingenuity was originally built for just five flights and that too during the summer season on Mars. Currently, temperatures at the Jezero crater are dropping to minus 80 degrees Celsius, so the mission team is shutting down the helicopter during the night. The solar-powered helicopter will continue to face challenges from Mars' cold and dusty winter conditions, but the completion of Flight 29 is one more thrilling achievement in flight on another world. So far, the 1.8-kilogram aircraft has traveled 7.17 kilometers in 55.38 minutes. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX has recently submitted new FCC filings for Starlink communications during the upcoming Starship orbital test flight. According to the filing, SpaceX intends to demonstrate high data rate communications with Starship and Super Heavy Booster through all phases of flight. Multiple Starlink terminals will be fitted to each vehicle to ensure a clear view of the SpaceX satellite constellation through the Starship flight profile. The FCC filing also shared some new insight into the orbital test flight profile. The Starship Super Heavy test flight will take off from SpaceX's South Texas Starship Development Facility, also known as Starbase. Previously, after stage separation, SpaceX planned to return and land the booster in the Gulf of Mexico, 20 kilometers from shore. But the updated flight profile suggests that SpaceX may return the booster to the launch site, where it will be captured by the integration tower's massive catching arms. However, till now, there has been no official announcement from SpaceX as to whether the booster will be landed in the Gulf of Mexico or returned to the launch site. Meanwhile, Starship will continue on its path to an altitude of about 250 kilometers before making a powered targeted landing in the Pacific Ocean, about 100 kilometers off the northwest coast of Kauai. Starship may also deploy several Starlink satellites into orbit during the flight. SpaceX did not reveal a target date for the Starship program's first orbital test flight, but an August launch is highly likely. At Starbase, SpaceX is actively preparing Starship 24 and Booster 7 for the orbital test flight. Super Heavy Booster 7, which was returned to the launch site two weeks ago, is getting ready for the static fire test campaign. Static fire testing was scheduled to begin on June 27. But, SpaceX has spent the last two weeks performing pneumatic proof tests on Booster 7, which involve filling, draining, and venting the prototype with nitrogen gas. These tests are conducted to check system integrity, safety, reliability, and leak tightness under pressurized conditions. SpaceX has a lot of experience igniting starships on the test stand, but they've only conducted a single super-heavy static fire test so far, and it was just a three-engine static fire test. So, it appears that SpaceX requires much more time to ensure everything is in order before beginning the static fire test campaign of Booster 7, which will eventually culminate in a 33-engine test fire. Moreover, it's likely that SpaceX may put Booster 7 through at least one successful wet dress rehearsal with liquid methane and oxygen propellants before beginning static fire tests. SpaceX had installed all 33 Raptor version 2 engines of the booster prior to its rollout to the launch site. But the engine thermal protection system installation isn't completely finished. So, SpaceX will need to finish fitting those panels before conducting static fire testing. Teams recently delivered a Raptor engine maintenance platform to the launch site. This platform will slide between the legs of the orbital launch mount and unfold to provide a work platform beneath the booster. 
While Booster 7 is being prepared for static fire tests, on July 5, SpaceX teams rolled Starship 24 from the build site to the launch site. After arriving at the build site, a crane lifted and placed Ship 24 on the suborbital launch pad B. Pad B is one of the suborbital launch pads from which Starship prototypes took off for their low-altitude test flight. SpaceX recently modified this pad to support Starship static fire testing. SpaceX now has Booster 7 with 33 engines and Ship 24 with 6 Raptor engines stationed at the launch site, and the company intends to begin the next round of ground testing as early as July 11. It's unclear if SpaceX will attempt to kick off Ship 24's testing on Monday or if they will continue testing Booster 7. Although it is unlikely, SpaceX is technically capable of simultaneously testing both Ship 24 and Booster 7. Only on the testing day, we will get a clear picture of the testing pattern, so keep an eye out for live streams from LabPodRe and other Starbase media. SpaceX teams recently completed stacking Super Heavy Booster 8 at the build site by lifting and placing the methane tank section over the oxygen tank section. The four chines, grid fins, hydraulic and electrical systems, aero covers and Raptor engines will be installed into the booster in the coming weeks. Works on Ship 25 are also progressing at the site. Recently SpaceX teams installed the payload bay door on the nose cone barrel section of the ship. Starlink satellites will be deployed through this door during the orbital flight of Ship 25. Teams installed the satellite dispenser into the payload bay two weeks ago. Thermal protection tile installation on the nose cone of Ship 25 is progressing. The oxygen tank section of Ship 25 is currently in the mid-bay. Once all the sections are fully ready, SpaceX will begin stacking Ship 25. The forward dome of Booster 10 was recently spotted at the construction site. This shiny new section is the first part of Booster 10 to appear at the production site. Work on the Starship launch tower and launch pad at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A is moving quickly. Pad 39A recently received the third section of the Starship launch tower. Four more tower sections are being prepared at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility for rollout to Pad 39A. The remaining two sections will be prefabricated at the site in the coming weeks. The fabrication of the rocket catching and stacking arm and its carriage is progressing at Roberts Road. The foundation and rebar work for the Roberts Road Mega Bay is also progressing. According to a recently released NASA document, SpaceX is looking for an additional 100 acres of land north of the Roberts Road site for office spaces and facilities to support vehicle and payload processing, fabrication, storage, manufacturing, and shipping and receiving. In addition, SpaceX plans to construct a 1.6-mile-long connector road to the site to facilitate transportation of starships and super-heavy vehicles from the operations area to Pad 39A. Here are the 14 resource areas that the new environmental assessment will consider before approving the site extension proposal. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.